Welcome to 30 Minute Reviews. I am Adam. This is going to be fun because I haven't done a live show in a while. I think the last one would have been um, Marvel uh, when Marvel announced their Phase 4 slate. Um, on top of that, I've gotten accustomed to recording and then editing, so I have more time to think and, uh, what's it called, like, cur- not curtail what I'm saying, but like, you know, get get everything together and, you know, if I say um a lot or, you know, which you're going to notice I'm going to say that a lot today. Um, so, uh, let's just dive right in. Um, so we have, uh, some announcements to make first and foremost. Um, let's go with the first thing, which is, if you do not know, I put the ad for every episode, but we have, uh, ongoing series on Kindle Vela. Um, if you go to bit.ly slash TMR books, you can see them all there. Um, on there, you can also see the, uh, what's it called? The, the cool, like, uh, um, what's we're looking for? The other, uh, there's a word I'm looking for here. I just can't think of it. Um, all the other books I've released and, the the, the Kindle Vela series that are happening as they happen. We have Taser and Acrobat. We have, um, what's the other one? Uh, Nanette and Rosebud, uh, The Alchemist and the Illusionist, and Tales from Another World, which periodically gets updated, but not really. It's more of, if I have an idea for a story that doesn't fall into any of the other ones, that's where it goes. Um, so all of them are up there. Um, on top of that, we also have, um, uh, Echo Alpha coming out later this year, um, November 20, I really should have written this down, that would have been the smart thing to do, uh, November 26th, which will be Black Friday, as usual, um, it's a sequel to The Muses, and, uh, that will be coming out, and that will be fun, too, um, I'm going to be spinning out Excellence into her own ongoing, probably in early 2022, um, and that will probably take the last slot of the month, um, but we'll see how that, you know, goes as we get closer and closer, um, so we will see where that happens, um, and, um, we are in very, very early pre-production on a movie. Um, we have Prelude, which is a cool little anthology movie. I uh, can't really talk too much about it now, but we are in very early pre-production on it. We have a few outlines, a few, um, what's it called, a few scripts, a few things like that. Um, but we will have more details in the future, um, just not right now. But that is, that is presently, um, in the, in the works to be happening, um, who knows how that will, uh, what's it called, how that will, uh, turn out, I think it'll be really cool, I really love the idea, it's an idea I've been kicking around with at work, um, while I'm working, and I really love what's, what what we're doing with that, um, so, yeah, let's, uh, let's, I'm looking forward to it, I'm looking forward to it a lot, um, so what I asked prior to this was for people to send in listener questions that I can talk about, um, over the course of the live show, uh, about anything, um, be it, you know, Star Wars, be it Marvel, be it DC, be it other movies, be it, um, like, any topic, any topic that people could want to, um, listen to me talk about, I, uh, I, I had people emailing questions, um, to, uh, 30 minute reviews at gmail.com, um, so I have aggregated a few of the questions, and uh, let's see what we got. So, first question, you know, I, I should have written down names, that would have been smart, but a lot of people submitted as anonymous. Um, so the first is, what are your favorite Star Wars EU works pre and post canon? Um, Star Wars Expanded Universe, or Extended, Expanded Universe, Extended Universe is DC. The Star Wars Expanded Universe is anything that's not the mainline movies, Prior to 2014, it was its own thing. Then in 2014, Disney, after the acquisition, threw out most of it. Um, so, um, and then started their own thing. So, before the Disney acquisition, um, 
before Disney had taken, you know, everything and threw it all out. Um, I would say, I know Crystal Star, Crystal Star has a lot of detractors because it's not a great book, but I did read it in like fifth grade, which if we really want to hone in on what Star Wars is, that's really what it is, is it's when you consumed it defines how much you like it. Um, if you were a kid when it came out, you like it more. If you were an adult when it came out, you tend to like it less. You have a more discerning eye as you grow older. And I think that that's another question later on, but like when we talk about why Star Wars didn't do well abroad while it did well here. And abroad, I mean China. It's like they didn't have it originally, so it wasn't banking on nostalgia. So you have to look at it as a standalone movie, not as the the generational event it was. Um, so um, I, I, I feel like it, I, there was a, a trilogy of books about Han Solo going back to his home planet. Um going back to Corellia, uh, and then, like, a battle taking out, uh, going out there. That one was pretty good. Um, there was, um, Heir to the Empire, which I still love. Um, I have a, a deep appreciation for, um, The Force Unleashed, and I know that a lot of people did not like that game or its sequel. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why. It was pretty, it's a pretty fun game. Um, to this day, utterly replayable if you can find a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox 360 to play it on. And it, it, it's totally worth your time to play that game. Um, so I, I don't understand why people, why people have such a hatred for it. It's like, yeah, it's over the top. Yeah, it's, it, it, it gets ridiculous, the powers of the Force and stuff like that. But it's a pretty fun game. Um, and the DLC patch, I, ended up, I didn't buy it when it first came out. I bought it later. So I got, like, the Game of the Year edition, which had all the DLC packs. Um, and I picked out... Um, I, I love the the alternate Dark Side story. Um, so that, that was always something that was really cool to me. Post-canon, um, I did really like the Leia soon-to-be trilogy, but right now duology, which is um, Queen's Peril and not Queen's Gambit. That's that show on Netflix, Queen's... Um, I forgot what the other one is, but uh, it's the story of Princess uh, or um, Queen Pad uh, uh, Padme, Queen Amidala, as she becomes uh, queen in the second book. In the first book, it takes place um, as she's getting footing in the Senate. The second book is a flashback to her becoming the um, her becoming the queen, and it's basically an alternate version of events, episode one. Which I really, I really dig that. I really like the we're gonna take something you already know and flip it on its head, and um, show you another side of events. Uh, I do really love when they do that, and I, that book did it very well. Um, there's also um, Alphabet Squadron, um, which is Alphabet Squadron, and then Shadowfall, and then Victory's Price. It's a a great look at the people who defected from the empire and it's always been like one of the things that you always talk about with like the clone wars and rebels and all of that is that these shows put the war in star wars where it's like when you watch the movies it's very much a um kind of sanitized to an extent like there's still some especially when you get to like rogue one and i would say to an extent even if you look past the teddy bears like the ground combat that happens in um in Return of the Jedi, is very war. But, like, you know, you don't really get that. When you get to the Clone Wars, you get the war aspect of it. And in the old canon, it was X-Wing and uh, Rogue Squadron. Here it's Alphabet Squadron, where it's the story of these ragtag group who all fly different, um, like, airship, uh, all different starfighter types. So um, they go by Alpha because an X-Wing, a U-Wing, a B-Wing, a Y-Wing, and an A-Wing. So... They all go out and do their thing, um, and it's a great, it's a, it's really a great story. And I, the the character uh, Yerika is really fun. Um, well, fun is the wrong word, but like um, they develop her very well over the course of it, and it's it's a it's a fantastic story. Um, it's really the first time too that I ran into the issue where you have uh, them trying to retcon um, what they were doing in the EU prior to episode nine, uh, and then the issue that 
came about where it's like when you when you look at what they were doing with like Operation Cinder, which you can see in like Battlefront. If you played a campaign for Battlefront two, you can see Operation Cinder, which is like the Emperor it's basically Operation Fuck Me, Fuck You, where the Emperor decides, like, okay, I'm dead now. You guys didn't want me, I'm gonna destroy the galaxy. Um so he goes out and he um he sends out these fleets to commit like war crimes on, on planets and they go out and they, they do this and they try to retcon it in Victory's Price to some success, but it's still kind of weird where it's like, no, this is part of a grander scheme where it's like in the event that the rebels killed him and took out a battle station, it was a serious problem. So they had to spread the rebels thin. So what they would do is they would go out and destroy things. So the rebels had to go and try and stop that on the various worlds um, while they amassed. And it's a whole big thing where it's like, it's, it explains why the Battle of Jakku was the big deal. Because it's always like, Jack, everyone's kind of like, Jakku is in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's even a line in The Last Jedi where it's like, Luke's like, where are you from? And she says, nowhere. And he goes, no, really, where are you from? And he goes, um, and she goes, Jakku. And he goes, all right, that basically is nowhere. Like, it, it is kind of a silly, you know, thing. But at the same time, it does kind of explain why why that you know why they did that and it doesn't quite mesh but you can kind of buy it which is really all you need because again this isn't a documentary it's a work of fiction so um this actually goes into my next question that i got where did the sequel trilogy fail um and i think we're far enough out now from the sequel trilogy and there's been enough talk on from, from various people involved, that we can kind of explain what happened. Um, I read Bob Iger's book, and the Star Wars acquisition was kind of rushed, and he was able to get approval to spend $4 billion to pay George Lucas for a Lucasfilm by promising a quick turnaround on that money. So what ended up happening was, because he promised a quick turnaround, he had to very quickly get the money Back, so they had to rush it into production. The first, uh, the episode seven, eight, and nine, and herein lies the problem with that. When you're doing a trilogy, you want to have at least an idea of where it's going to go, where it's going to end, and what general character arc you want to put your characters on. You can't do like what they did here, where it's kind of like three movies that like kind of relate to each other, but not really. Like, if we look at, like, um, like you know, let's look at specifically um, Finn. Cause I think Finn got shortchanged the hardest out of anyone in terms of character development and character depth. Where it's like, in the first movie, he is a, um, he, he's, a he's an Imperial defector. He, or a First Order defector. He was a, a stormtrooper for the First Order. He, he moves from there to you know, joins the Rebel Alliance or the Resistance, not entirely willingly, but not entirely unwillingly either. Like, it's not like he's there entirely on his own accord. Like, he has no other option at that point. So he kind of joins in and is kind of, like, forced along. Then we get to The Last Jedi, and now he has the choice. The choice to be a member of the Resistance or to defect again, and then just keep on the run. And in the beginning, it seems like he's just going to go and run again. And then, through the course of the movie, he grows and develops into being, you know, a, a, a member of the Resistance, which is culminated in that scene... Well, it culminates twice, but he, he has that acknowledgement and realization and gives that realization to the First Order when he faces off with Phasma on the, uh, on, on the, whatever the hell the name of Kylo Ren's ship is, and she says scum, and he said rebel scum, because that's him outwardly acknowledging where he has, where he has come to. And then there is, um, what's it called? Then there is the, uh, the, the third moment, or the second moment in that movie, where he is now willing to give his life in the service of this. And then Rose stops him. Um, from from sacrificing himself by flying directly into the the Death Star cannon thing, and then we get to the Rise of Skywalker, which unlike say 
the uh, the previous movies where it's like we're going to develop him towards this. The next logical step is, and it's built throughout the movie, but they never take the step necessary, is that Finn should be leading a rebellion of the people who were taken by the, what's it called, taken by the First Order. Um, Because throughout the movie, they they kind of build to the fact that's going to happen, where it's like early on we have General Pride saying like, um, oh, we need to abduct more children, too. It, 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 it's the most mustache, twirly villain thing ever. It's like, we need to abduct more children to power our super weapons, and it's like, yeah, okay. And then it's like, okay, so we know all the people on these Death Stars are all forcible conscripts, not willing conscripts, which, as we talk, as they talk about in, like, The Bad Batch, it's like they swapped from the clones to the 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 voluntary conscripts because they realized the voluntary conscripts would be willing to commit atrocities on their behalf. So you already have a bunch of people who they're there on these ships who are not there by choice, and they're all abducted as children and, and forced into this. And, and Finn knows this because Finn is one of those people. Janna knows this because she is one of those people, probably Lando's daughter. And we, we know all of this is happening. We, we, we know that, you know... Because of that, what should have happened is Finn should have led a rebellion where he got these abducted people to, to you know, turn on the First Order. And that would have been a, a better moment. And I think that this all comes down to the fact that there was no concrete plan going into this because it feels like J.J. tells the first part of the story and leaves Ryan Johnson in a very weird position where it's like, okay, well, I've killed Han... So nothing I can do there. I can't do anything with Han now because Han is dead and Han can't come back as a Force ghost. And unless you're JJ and you're going to have him come back as a memory instead of a Force ghost. The semantic difference is weird. Um, so, all right, that character's off the table. Luke has thrown himself into isolation after failing as a Jedi Master, which Ryan Johnson gets shit for that, but that's not his fault. I mean, I will I will assign him blame for the Canto bite sequence, and yes, I, I understand that the entire thing goes to establish Finn's swap, um, but I don't think you need that for Finn to realize there's evil in the universe, considering he was abducted by the First Order. Um, I don't think you... And, and he watched his friend die, and it's like, I don't think you need that length to to make me understand that character's turn. But I, I don't think that that's the case. Um, and then he le- and because he leaves him in the situation where it's like, well, now I'm going to tell the story based on where he left it. I'm going to tell it in the way that I would continue this story, where it's like I'm picking up the the line from where he left it. Let me continue it out from here and see where it goes. And I think that, the way Ryan went, had we gotten um, Duel to Fish, which is Trevorrow's scripts, I, I think that that would have been a better movie than what we finally got in The Rise of Skywalker, but I don't think it would have been at good. It still wouldn't have been good. It wouldn't have been as good as I would say. Like, I would say that The Rise of Skywalker is not as good as either of the prior two, Um trilogy finales in that it's nowhere near as good as Return of the Jedi, and it's also, I would say, not as good as uh, Revenge of the Sith, but going on from there, I, I don't think that, I, I don't think it would have been better than Revenge of the Sith, but I think it would have been better than what we got, um, and it would have felt more cohesive and concrete and a better way to end off the characters in a more conclusive way than, than doing what they did. Uh, and I think that what ended up happening is when they, um, when they fired Trevorrow, um, part of their firing spree where they fired Lord Miller, they fired Trevorrow, they fired Josh Trank, they fired someone else, and what ended up happening was they, they brought back JJ because it's like okay, the first movie made a lot of money, we'll bring back JJ, that'll solve this problem. And it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on a severed limb, and it's like, that's not going to solve the problem. And, and really, a lot of the problem was not really a problem. Like, the problem they were looking at was, like, people being vocally angry on the internet, but really, it's a very small subset 
of people amplified by big names, which really didn't help the situation at all. So I think that if we're going to look at this in that way, um, where it's like the, the problem was they didn't plan. And it's like they should have written out the three scripts, outlined where they were going, and then gone from there rather than this idea. But it's very obvious based on the fact that there are things undone in um, – what's all There are things undone in the the rise of uh, – in, in The Last Jedi that undoes what's in Force Awakens. And there are things in The Rise of Skywalker that und- undo what's in um, The Last Jedi. And it, it's small things like – you know, that that takes screen time. Like, Ryan Johnson takes Kylo Ren's mask and smashes it against the wall um, to to move him, you know, past needing that mask. That's part of his development. He doesn't need that mask. And for where Ryan Johnson was sending the story, where Kylo Ren is the supreme leader and he is the final boss rather than, you know, a redemption arc, that would have made sense. And it's like, when, and then we have to spend time in the Rise of Skywalker to have him putting the mask back together because the mask is to hide. And, it, and it's small things like that. Meanwhile, it's like the uh, Luke's ship being underwater and then Luke lifting it out as a force ghost. It's like, well, that's like, that's just silly. And it un- undoes what the point of that scene is. Cause it's like for Luke, his, the reason why he couldn't lift the ship in, um, Empire Strikes Back is because he wasn't ready to confront Vader. It was a symbol, a symbolic thing where it's like, I can't lift this ship. That's me saying I'm not ready to confront Vader. And it's a, it's a visualization of that moment. When we look at, in that moment when Luke lifts it, it doesn't culminate his arc in any way because it's like he has already completed his mission. Like, it, it's not, it, it's, it's a fan service moment to be sure, but it doesn't, like make narrative sense or symbolic sense even wherein if you look at like had Ray lifted it out that would have made more sense because it's her saying I'm ready to confront the emperor but the whole thing is let's not get into it again um so the next question is what are your top three guilty pleasure movies I've said this before I don't like the word guilty pleasure um because I feel like it is diminutive um to begin with I feel like if it's something that is not illegal you should not feel guilty about enjoying it um that said if it comes on i will watch um hmm, i will watch i'll watch clueless if it comes on i'll watch mommy if it comes on um like they're both utterly watchable movies um i can't really think of a third because i'm pretty like vocal about what i like and what i like not really what i don't like but what i do like it's like if I like it, I'll talk about it, and if I like it, then I'll I'll watch it. Um, but there's there's no other really guilty pleasure movie I could think of that's like I'd be like, oh well, someone might judge me if I say I like this. Um, so definitely, I'll say those two. Um, what are your favorite non-genre TV shows? And when I refer to non-genre, I mean not uh, based on an existing science fiction or fantasy franchise. So not. Star Wars or Marvel or DC or anything like that. Uh, I really liked You um, on Netflix. Um, Greg Berlanti produced it, and I should have realized that in season two um, when they had the episode that's kind of par for the course in anything that Greg Berlanti does. And if you watch The Flash or you watch Arrow or you watch anything like that, like the second half of the backdoor uh, pilot for Flash has this, where it's character gets drugged or poisoned or... Um, hit in the head or another way um, mentally impaired and starts seeing ghosts from his past. And it is such a cliche, but he does it in every one of his shows. And then that show had an episode in season two. I was like, oh yeah, that that's him. Um, because then Beck starts showing up and, and that's it. I really like that show. Um, if we're going to talk network TV, um, I do really like um, The Neighborhood. I'll watch Parks and Recreation in the office. Um, there was another show that I really like. Oh, The Good Place is fun. Um, Modern Family is another one that, that is, that is rewatchable. Um, but, uh, yeah. Oh, Frasier. Um, so, um, then these next two I'm going to put together, um, because one leads into the other. 
Um, what made you fall in love with movies? And what was the biggest, what is the current biggest existential threat to movies, to, to film as a whole, as a genre or a, a, or a medium? Um, and I think it's pretty, they're, they're pretty intertwined because for me, the moment that made me like really like get interested in the craft of filmmaking and like seeing how it's done is back in the nineties, there were, um, Disney had the Masterpiece Collection. And on these VHSs, they had um, special features the same way they do now. And at the end, they always they always had these little mini documentaries uh, about like how they made it and like the history of it and things like that. Um, and two really stand out to me. It was The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh and Peter Pan had these documentaries about how they did everything. And it's like, when they talk about like casting and how they did the animation and how they did kind of like a proto motion capture, um, with hand drawn animation where they had, um, a woman act out as Tinkerbell for Peter Pan, um, the sequences, and then they would hand draw based on what she acted out. And it it was, it, it is really motion capture, but the 1940s version of motion capture. And it's a pretty, cool it was a pretty cool thing i remember watching that and being really interested um and and i i feel like that that was the thing that really got me and i think that the the decline of home media is probably one of the biggest existential threats to film because of the lack of the ability to watch special features like um if you look at like a movie that is um that is out on DVD. Go go to Walmart. Go to Target. Go to any number of um, other places that have um, that, that that sell DVDs. Um, look at the DVD on the back, and it'll have a list of all the special features, and it'll have a list of what what is there. And sure, there um, there is definitely some like what's it called? Some, some a lot of help you can get from watching the deleted scenes. And I'll give credit to Disney Plus because I do put the deleted scenes on. But, like, HBO Max doesn't. Peacock doesn't. Paramount Plus doesn't. Netflix doesn't. And what these things do is they are a very valuable tool, not just for filmmaking, but for storytelling. Because what happens is, like, let's look at Endgame as, as, one, as the first example. Um, when they were trying to break Avatar's record, they put out a version that had a tribute to Stan Lee at the end and then also had a... Um, uh, a deleted scene with the Hulk, and what this deleted scene does is it's it's a it's a it's a very poorly rendered scene of the Hulk going and saving people from a burning building, and and then he answers the phone and then you hear it's it's Banner, and what that scene does is it conveys the information that Banner has merged with the Hulk and they are now one entity and all of that. When you watch the movie, that scene isn't there there's a scene in the diner. And once you know that that scene in the diner is a, uh, is a reshoot scene, um, you can tell because you look um, very infrequently are people shown in a full four, four shot. It's always like a two shot or a two shot or a close up on one or something like that. So it was all shot, you know, remotely without having everyone physically present there for it. Um, I also think that, you know, and, and that's an interesting thing. So like when you, Look at deleted scenes. You can see what information is cut, why was it cut, and all of that. You can kind of put that together. I think the the thing that's lost most, more than anything else, is like commentary tracks, where they talk about how they broke the story and how they got you know from point A to point B. Like the the commentary track on Infinity War is very informative about how they balanced all these characters and how they did everything they had to do for this movie. Um, the behind the scenes featurettes about how they built the what's it called? How they they built practical props and how they went out of their way to you know to design things in a way that made it work and how the visual effects work and all of that stuff. These are things that are gonna make people want to get into the field. But if you're gonna take that away and just do that, you have that problem. Then on top of that, it's kind of an extension of what happens when you lose the video store. Is without home media, there's this lack of seeing what's different and what's new. That's not just a big studio release. Um, 
Now, I know that, like, on Amazon, they got a lot of things that you can watch that didn't come from a studio. They're independent films and, and things like that, and there will always be independent film, but it, it, at the end of the day, it's going to be defined by whose independent film gets bought by a bigger distributor to be able to go somewhere else. And I think that that's part of the problem when we talk about this broadly, is that um, when, when you go to Walmart, you can find a bunch of... Um, DVDs of movies that no one's heard of. Um, and it's like, I found some really interesting movies there. I found a lot of really shitty movies there. But, like, you know, I, I found, like, The Immortal Wars, and I, which is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Um, and it's like, when you look at these things and you see what was, uh, what is available there, compare it to what's, when you go on Netflix. Um, when you go on Netflix, they're going to promote to you what they paid a lot of money for, so they want you to watch it. So like Seinfeld, very heavily marketed because Seinfeld is something they paid a lot of money to get from Hulu. Um, like any Netflix original is going to be very heavily promoted in an effort to get you to watch what they spent a lot of money on. The things that are just on there that they didn't spend a lot of money on, if it's not an Oscar uh, movie or something like that that's going to get a lot of attention in another way. It falls by the wayside. That's how things like all of a sudden Squid Game getting the, the notoriety it is is such a, a weird thing because it's like someone watched it and it's like, this show's fucked up. You got to watch this. But Netflix wasn't promoting it until they started, you know, until they, they started getting a lot of people watching it. Then they started promoting it. And it's the same thing where it's like Disney Plus is just Disney movies. Um, HBO Max has some independent film. But largely, it's movies that are distributed to HBO or Turner Classic Movies, and 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 DC and um and you know Cartoon Network. And what ends up happening is, number one, you lose a back catalog of older movies that haven't been preserved well. Number two, you also lose the the ability to find something new that wasn't handpicked by the studio and distributor that you are watching, and and that's a big part of it. Um, so I think that that's something that should be explored and and should be. You know, discuss. That's why I like to buy my movies physically and not, you know, stream whenever possible, because it, it's better for me to watch the movie um, physically because then I get everything out of it and I prefer to have it there physically. Plus, is the whole you know issue of ownership versus um, you know leasing a uh, buying a license to view. Like if you bought a game on the PlayStation Three. Um, that is a PlayStation 1 classic. Like, let's say you went on there, which I, I have done. I bought, um, way back in, like, 2013, I bought, um, well, uh, like, bowling. There was a PlayStation 1 bowling game that I bought for, like, $1.99 because I had it when I was a kid for PlayStation 1. Um, for no reason other than they didn't want to, it didn't get ported to the PlayStation 4. So it's stuck there unless I keep my PlayStation 3 maintained. So, like... Great, because I don't own the game. I don't have that ability. And it's like, you know, when you buy a movie on PlayStation, if you don't watch it for a certain amount of time, you lose the license. Um, so that's something else to look out for. If, if, if a movie is on iTunes and then they lose the contract with iTunes, guess what? You're SOL. You have to get, you have to go somewhere else and, and buy that movie again. Um, so that's why I don't like buying digital. Um, plus, if you have to keep track of what streaming service it's on, that's another annoyance where it's like, okay, well, I have Hulu. I like to watch Seinfeld. Oh, wait, Seinfeld isn't on Hulu anymore. Now it's over here. Oh, wait, The Office isn't on Netflix anymore. Now it's on Peacock. Oh, wait, for some reason, Frazier's on, like, four streaming services. Why is that? Who knows? Um, but it, it's, like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem, I think. Um, so I think that streaming in that way is a big threat to film. Plus, this whole thing with the IA strike, where it's like they're going to strike over the the atrocious wages that Netflix is paying, with the uh, the, the the borderline criminal hours they're making them work. Um, yeah, I, I, that's why I don't really like Netflix. Um, so, what movie would you like to see the full director's cut of, akin to the Snyder cut? Um, like we, I mean, we just called these director's cuts back in the day, and it's like, yeah, we're getting re-edits of movies, um, but I, I think maybe Schumacher's cut of, I think it was, um, Batman Forever had a very lengthy cut that got cut down to a theatrical, um, there was also, what was the other one, um, Black Panther had a four-hour cut, 
Um, that would be awesome if they released that on Disney Plus. They're, they're probably not going to, but um, that would be cool. Um, there was a lengthy cut of. There was another movie that had a famously long cut that got cut down. Um, I think those are the only two I think off the top of my head, though. Oh, oh, and I would love to see Lord and Miller solo. Um, because they shot like at least half to three quarters of that movie. Like they were almost done with production when they got fired. I would love to see what they did, uh, and why they got fired more than anything else. Um, so, so Lord and Miller solo, that's the other one. Um, what movie or TV show should be rebooted today with a modern twist? And this is a question that I've addressed a few times, um, because there's a few, uh, movies and TV shows that I think would work well. Uh, Max Headroom, I think is a pretty obvious choice. And I'm surprised the CW doesn't have one of these in development because, you know, the CW just does everything whenever they feel like it, um, for the hell of it. Like, it, it kind of is, like, a joke network, which, like, the CW has, a sh- like, an entire night of DC shows. The CW network has, um, I downloaded The Republic of Sarah, which it did not get picked up for a season two, but I've heard, like, it seems like an interesting concept. It has All-American, it has Riverdale, it has all this stuff. I'm surprised Max Headroom isn't there. It's the story of a guy who's a reporter who to report the news in a way that's kind of, you know, going to get attention and not get him, you know, not lose, not get him in legal trouble. He he does it under the pseudonym with this giant head. And it's it's the kind of thing that I think would work now uh, in the modern era. Um, also, my other go to anytime this question is asked is always the Roaring Twenties, the James Cagney Humphrey Bogart movie. Um, if you have not seen this movie, you have to watch this movie um, because it is so poignant. And just when you watch this movie and you see that this movie came out in the 30s, and it's about a guy who went off to fight in World War I, comes back, and no one has his back now that he's back from fighting in this war. Um, so he has to turn to crime. And it's this movie about how the criminal, uh, how the legal system fails people, how VA fails people, and, and how it, how people get, you know, caught up in a situation. And it's such a great movie that could be done today. And it, it, it's one of those things that I would love to see happen. Um, but I think that in order for it to, you know, work today, I think if you did it with a white guy today, it would not. I mean, it would sell because it'd be like you get a bunch of white people like, oh, yeah, that sucks. But it's like, it's also not, like, it, it's accurate to an extent, but I think that it would be more impactful if it was, say, Michael B. Jordan in the leading role, um, directed by, say, a Ryan Coogler. Um, I think that would be a really point where, or like, I could see, like, a Jordan Peele kind of movie. Uh, not a comedy per se, but him handling it as a drama, or Ava DuVernay. Um, also, excellent choice, uh, if we were to make that movie, um, but, yeah, um, that, that, that would be my other, uh, my other reboot idea, um, who would you make a biopic of, and I think that I would go more cinematic with a biopic, in, in that I would go with someone who is on screen, um, more than, like, a music biopic, or something like that, because if you talk about, like, um, music biopics, the person who's financing the movie doesn't have a direct financial stake in them making the person look good. In that, we will never get a true Walt Disney biopic because the Walt Disney Company will never let that happen. Um, same way we won't get one about the Warner Brothers. We will never get one, like, about Judy Garland. That is realistic. Because, like, that movie came out with Renee Zellweger, but, like, they completely glossed over the fact that the studios, like, put her on, like, every drug imaginable and, like, to keep her, uh, like, awake so she can work 23-hour days to to make movies for them. Like, they worked these people, like, pack mules, and, and, and they treated them like animals as they were making these movies back in the day. And that's something that we just completely forget about. And, and Hollywood doesn't showcase this aspect of their history because it doesn't behoove them to. Like, it doesn't make them look good. And if they're making the movies, they have no incentive to make the movies accurate. Um, so it, it's, it's better to portray this. It's like 
someone gets the the ability to portray themselves, they're always going to portray themselves in the best light. They're not going to make themselves look bad or make their comp- competition look bad because, like, say the Walt Disney Company, may, uh, say Warner Brothers were to make a movie about Walt Disney and portray him in a negative light, um, that would like that would nothing would stop Disney from being all right. You want to do? We want to play it this way. We'll do the same thing. And then do it right back. Like there's, there is no reason. Like it's kind of like a detente by the fact that they don't want to have the negative press themselves come from like looking under the floorboards at their at looking into the skeletons in their closet. Um. So so I think that like if I were to do it and I didn't have to worry about the backing of a studio, I would do like you know like that's the thing is like I would love to see a Stanley biopic. I would love to see a Jim Henson biopic, and 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 by all account, like oh, well, you know, Stanley had his um, what's it called, like wasn't was a shrewd businessman, which is a nice way of saying he was a dick to his business partners. But looking at like uh, like Jim Henson, by all accounts, is a great guy. Like I'd love to see a Jim Henson biopic. Um, that that'll be my answer. Um, what comics are you currently reading and like? I'm reading The Death of Doctor Strange as it comes out. Um, which is different from saying I like the death of Doctor Strange. Uh, it feels kind of silly. Um, and it's a roundabout way to, spoilers, uh, kill Doctor Strange, bring back Doctor Strange, and have a new Sorcerer Supreme. Um, like, like that's where this is ending up. It's just, you know, a long-winded way of getting there. Make it events so you can sell comics, and it's it's just kind of, you know, a thing that they're doing, and it's, you know transparent um i did just read why the last man the first arc unmanned uh, i read that last night i actually really enjoyed that uh love sandman if you haven't read sandman i definitely recommend that um what else is there uh i mean there's there are the obvious ones i love daredevil i think i've talked about this before i think that there's any character that i have the most consistent love of it's daredevil um because i like i love um born again love man without fear um, loved Mayor Fisk, the run that they did recently, looking very much forward to Devil's Reign. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with Frank Miller's runs on Daredevil, um, or Frank Miller in general, like Dark Knight Returns is great, you know, um, so I'm trying to get, like, I, I have Paper Girls, I have Saga, and I have, um, uh, Goddess Mode, um, that I've been intending to read, but I have not yet, so those are next up on my list. Um, next up, what is your most unpopular movie opinion? Hmm. All right. Let me lay this one out there. Um, my most unpopular movie opinion is that had the Fantastic Four from 2007, 2005, the one with Chris Evans as the Human Torch, if that movie came out and was part of the MCU and it came out exactly the same movie, but, um, with updated visual effects to match where we are today. And with, um, there was one other change that had to happen. Oh, like updated cultural touchstones. Like, I don't think they could go to a BMX rally cause I don't think that would resonate, but if they updated the cultural touchstones at the time, um, it, would be a success. It would be a cinematic success, and it would be a. It would have been as well received as any other Marvel origin movie. Um, same thing with Rise of the Silver Surfer. Um, that said, if it was Marvel Studios, Rise of the Silver Surfer wouldn't happen as a movie because you know the Silver Surfer is a uh, you know is, is gonna like Galactus isn't gonna be the bad guy in one Fantastic Four movie. It's gonna be a Avengers level threat. But yeah. Um, I think that had that happened, it would have been a great, you know, thing. Um, and the last question, what books should be adapted for tele- television or theatrical? Um, I would have said The Magic Treehouse would have been my pick as a good TV show. I would have done animated on a streamer um, or even on network. I could see that working on like a Cartoon Network or a, I mean, Cartoon Network's not going to do it because they do Teen Titans Go 23 hours a day, but, like, Nickelodeon could have run that, or Disney Channel could have run that, um, or even Discovery Kids could have run that. That would have been a perfect fit, actually. Discovery Kids doing uh, Magic Treehouse, 
fan, would have been a fantastic thing because they did that that King Tut show back in the day, and there was a show with a shark. I don't remember what it was called, but if, if they did those, that would have been a fantastic mix of subject matter um, with format with uh, network, where it's the, it's it's about these two kids who go to a treehouse they find in the woods, and it's got a bunch of books in it. And if they point to a picture in the book, they can go to wherever that is. And they can explore all throughout history and, and go to major touchstone events and things like that. Like, they go to the Titanic, they go to the Olympics, they go back to prehistoric times, they go to the Days of the Nights, they go to meet William Shakespeare, they go all over the place. And and they're making a movie, and I don't think the movie's going to be good. Um, because, like, yeah, they had these four book arcs. Like, it was like, it, it kind of was one of those things that, like, before I read comics, I was reading these. And it kind of got me into that mentality of reading an arc of story over the course of many stories um if that makes sense and it was it was kind of the first introduction to that um i also think that but now that that's off the table so uh, i would say the unwanted which is a great story about you know how what you love um doesn't define your worth to society uh it's a dystopian mid-grade book and i think that would be a really good one uh, another one that I'm surprised hasn't been done yet. I mean, it was done once, but I think I said this a few weeks ago when I did this, when I took this question. Um, what uh, uh, the baseball card adventures? I think it's called uh, with with Joe Stashak from a uh, Dan Gutman book um, about this kid who can travel back in time to meet baseball greats. Because I, I like when we look at like sports in America, um, we look at our baseball heroes the way that we look at other fictional heroes, like like the, the names of baseball greats for a lot of people, I know for me and people my age, like are ingrained in us the way that, you know, Greek gods are. Where it's like there's a pantheon and it's like you have Jackie Robinson, you have uh, Babe Ruth, you have Lou Gehrig, you have Mickey Mantle, you have all of these people and it's like, this kid goes back in time all throughout time to meet these people. And there's always this little story that happens before and after where it's like he meets someone and he talks to them and, you know, and, and there's some, something that happens and he, he learns something from the people. And it's like, it's, it's such a great thing. And I think the only reason why baseball hasn't done this is because Dan Gutman took a very pro shoeless Joe Jackson stance and, um, for those of you who don't know, because we're getting into sports talk, but Shoeless Joe Jackson was um, on the Chicago White Sox back in, I think it was 1909 was the year they were in the World Series, and they were accused, well, not accused, members of the Chicago White Sox in that year through the World Series um, a- after being paid off by the mob in Chicago. So they they, they throw the World Series, and, um, and uh, there's a bunch of finger-pointing about who did what, and one of the people who was accused was Shoeless Joe Jackson, who, who had he not um, been involved in this, would be a Hall of Famer. Um, but it turned out that there is some contention over whether he actually did it or was as involved as I thought he was. I'm inclined to believe that he wasn't as involved as he actually was. And this book really is probably the reason why that I started that belief and then looked into it more and, and, and learned that. And it doesn't make the MLB look good. So I'm thinking that's the only reason why it doesn't happen. Um, so that would be another pick. Um, I would do, like, if I'm Disney, I don't know why they don't, like, do, like, animated versions of, like, Marvel comic runs the way that DC does. Where it's like they have the Killing Joke, they have the Long Halloween, they have all these other things. Like... I don't know why they don't do that for Marvel Comics. I think that'd be a good way to get people into comics. Um, I, I, that would be a cool thing. Or do like two D animated versions of the Star Wars extended universe, expanded universe stories that are no longer canon. Um, that would be cool too. I don't think they're gonna do that though. Um, there's one. Of, there are a few other books that like are just escaping me right now. Um, but. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll wrap up there for today. Uh, next week, we will talk about our uh, the big news about the Agatha Harkness show, about the uh, the new Star Wars expanded universe books, um, about uh, 
the that ninety show, and we're gonna continue our talk about uh, why is uh, Christopher Nolan a douchebag. So we'll be back with that uh, next Thursday, as we are every Thursday. Uh, and until then, have a great rest of your week. And we'll be back on next Sunday with a live show about what happens at DC Fandom. Um, so until then, have a great rest of your week.